actor, director, soon to be autobiographer. The book is called Don't Tell Dad, if the publishing company doesn't screw it up. Dad, of course, would be Henry Fonda, sister Jane Fonda, uh, talented and beautiful daughter Bridget, carrying on the family's acting legacy. He plays, this gentleman, two interesting roles in the film Nadja. How do you play two roles in the same film, Mr. Fonda? Peter? Well, I'd say this is called getting your steak and eating it too. <laughs> <laughs> now, you play, do you play a vampire? In a... Uh, I play Drac, Dracula. Dracula, okay. Um, and uh, I also play Dr. Van Helsing, who has okay. been played by Peter Cushing, right, right. Uh, Tony Hopkins, Larry Olivier, some great actors right, who played right, this right. role. Uh, no one's taking the spin I, I took on it, though. Let's take a look at a clip real quick, because I want to set this up so we know what we're talking about. Most people get way into the interview and then show a clip. Let me look at this. That's smart. You're right. Let's do it. She can't see us. She doesn't know you anymore. Wait, wait. Either you do what I say, or you get off at the next floor. This is a comedy. <laughs> yeah, it, it actually is a comedy and uh, very uh, thrown away. So yeah. you just got a, a slice of it, but it's very, very avant garde. But you've always me... been associated with those kind of films, really. I mean, I know you've done other types of roles, but nobody's ever said you'd make a great corporate executive. <laughs> well, uh, actually, I have a very good corporate executive. I <laughs> but I mean, you don't, uh, you don't play. The, they don't think of you for those roles. Do they? No, um, they don't like to think about me at all, Roger. Really? <laughs> no. Why? Well, Easy Rider. Are you difficult? No, not at all. As a matter of fact. Uh, but Easy Rider pegged you as a certain way. It's that the movie, the way it was made, how much it cost. Three hundred and three hundred seventy-two thousand dollars, and uh, none of it was Hollywood studio money, and it was the only movie that made money for Columbia Pictures for almost two years. And uh, none of their personnel, none of their great big staff, nobody in business affairs, nobody of their company had something to do with the making of the motion picture. They hated it for that reason. And even though several regimes have gone down since we made it, they still are right on. They don't like that picture. And they, it's not Harper that they don't like. It's me directly and Bert Schneider, who was the executive producer who gave me the money to make the movie. Bert got the money from the monkeys. He and Bob Rafelson did The Monkeys, a TV show. Sure. So, in fact, Easy Rider was made with monkey money. <laughs> but uh, Hollywood saw us as, as trying to overthrow their system. Mm. And I said, how egotistical. I'm not after their system at all. I want the government in Washington. I just want to be able to make Would you them... overthrow the government if you could? I would, in flash, absolutely. Why, what's wrong with it? This is not, I mean, you haven't chosen to live in another country. You must no, not at like all. this country pretty I, well. I like it. I like the precepts uh, of the country. But I happen to agree with Mr. Jefferson when he put into the uh, Declaration of Independence life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Most of the governors of the other states didn't want the pursuit of happiness in there, thought it was too frivolous for such an important document. In fact, it's not. Um, I'd like to see the Bill of Rights enacted. Uh, I don't think we need a, an amendment for uh, term limits on politicians. We have the vote. If the 28 percent of the public voted in the last election was a, an off-year election, is, is absolutely embarrassing to me. We have a government that's... Do you vote? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Do you I, find candidates that appeal to you always? Not always. No, I, then it's the lesser Who of two do you evil. like for 96? Who do you see, Clinton or somebody else? <laughs> I can't. You set me up for this one. No, no, I'm I, just I, curious. Literally, no, 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 I didn't this is great. I, I just saw this uh, on my way out of my ranch yesterday. Oh, no. Yeah, it, uh, Monday I left my ranch and went to Los Angeles. I saw this bumper sticker as I was driving like a madman to get the airport on time. But I had time to read the bumper sticker, and it said, he's arrested He's tan and he's ready. Nixon in '96. <laughs> <laughs> I'll 
I'll vote for myself if I can't find anybody else. Really? Mm hmm What kind of a president would you make? Well, I, I would get rid of the Federal Reserve right away. You would? Yeah. I, what don't, else think would that, I don't think the government should have uh, our money. It's obviously not capable of handling it very well. I don't so mind you're against my, taxation? No, I don't mind paying my taxes. Okay. I mind how... It's regulated. It's regulated and spent. Mm-hmm. And uh, what, what do my you think taxes is aren't enough to actually cause any effect on the major lobby people. So, you know, even if my brother-in-law, who makes two and a half billion dollars a year, so his taxes are pretty big, but it doesn't touch what the lobbies do against uh, Ted Turner. the citizen. Yeah. He makes how much? Two and a half billion bucks. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money. Yeah, it but is a lot of money. He puts it back into his business. He's a very frugal man. He. Uh, he doesn't. Uh, he well, doesn't how big is their land. ranch? It's about five thousand acres, isn't it? That's a lot of land for one person. Well, how big is their ranch? You... Which ranch do you want to oh. start talking about? <laughs> I mean, they have a big ranch in Montana. They have one near you, right? Two. They have two ranches in Montana. Do you need two ranches? I mean, is that? It's better than people subdividing it up and putting double wides or single wides on it. I can promise you that. And he deeds it all back to the Nature Conservancy. Ted used to be a conservative. What happened? I think he I was. I think when he met your sister, he kind of. Flipped over and became a liberal, didn't he? No, he had he had made that switch before that. Oh, You're he did? very right. I think he was even probably. Uh, I'm not sure, but I think he might have been a member of the John Birch Society. Really? That far right. Well, that's a revelation. I think that it's his own company and news gathering that brought the news of the world to his attention in such a way that he realized we needed to have world peace, disarmament and equal uh, justice. Do you believe in countries? Do you believe that everybody ought to have, like America ought to be American, Italy ought to be Italy, or do we need no, to kind eventually of No, eventually we'll all be, if, if we stick around and don't discord it totally, we'll still be Italy and we'll still be America, but America is a different experiment than Italy. America is Italians, is Russians, is Polish, is Japanese, is Chinese, is Africans, is all, all it is the melting pot. And it should stop there, but now look at how we start to divide ourselves out. Suddenly people are African Americans, Italian Americans. Are the only real Americans just white Englishmen? I don't believe, I, I can't buy that. We're either Americans or we, we've got to reevaluate the whole scene. That's why I said I wouldn't hesitate to overthrow the system. I would think get rid of the Supreme Court, take it, just dismiss everybody and start over. <laughs> Seriously. That's great. Like your father order. was a well-known Hollywood liberal. Do you, are your philosophies aligned? I mean, are you in that area? I've got 30 seconds for break. Yeah. Later, but, but basically, that's... Yeah, you, I, I would, you I would put myself in my father's uh, political bend. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting. We'll be right back. Peter Fond is here, and uh, the film is called Najib. Uh It's a very interesting film, very funny, and uh, you should see it. Come back, and we're going to answer a few more of these questions in just a minute. with actor, director, writer, and uh, he's here about a new film called Nadja. Peter Fonda is with us. Peter, you started talking about your father being a, you, you being a, aligned with him philosophically, but your father was great friends with guys like Jimmy Stewart mm -hmm. and John Wayne, uh, who were very conservative type people. You must have known them because oh, yes. you grew up. How did you feel about them? Did you, did you resent them when you became politically liberal or did you understand that they had a right or they had a conservative for, point of view that I resented them for a moment Roger because uh, Ward Bond and the Duke vilified my father by saying he was a pinko actually the US government lifted his passport I'm looking at Tom Jode I'm looking at young Mr. Lincoln I'm looking at Wyatt Earp and they lifted his passport what can happen then? Well, when how people, did your father stay friends with Wayne? Or was well, it? they fell out, and it wasn't until much later when they did in harm's way that they got back together again. And Wayne, I mean, I, I liked the Duke very much. You liked him personally, or liked yeah, his work? I liked his personal. I, I thought he was a beautiful man as as a young younger man, and I thought he really understood how to project on film, and. Uh, I have a great deal of respect for his career, and from what I know of him as a man, I have a great deal of respect. I didn't agree with his politics, but if you let that get in your way, then you're back to African-American, Italian-American, 
Jewish American. Wait a minute. Um, Do you have any conservative friends today? My brother-in-law. <laughs> no. uh, your brother-in-law's. Uh, yes, I do have. We're living right here in New York City. He's conservative. He's uh, very intelligent, and uh, we never argue about politics. Tell me about your autobiography, Don't Tell Dad. Tell me about the title, Don't Tell Dad, first. I can't. Well. Oh, you can't tip that off? I can't tip that off. But uh, Did you have a good relationship? One, Did you have a good relationship with your father? The last words he spoke on the planet before, before he died, we were all in the intensive care unit in Cedars of Sinai in Los Angeles, and uh, he was lying on the bed and he his big baby blues going like this, trying to find focus, looking at his fifth wife. You know? And he looks over at his daughter, he's trying to find focus. And he looks over at the comic, I mean, Tom Hayden. And, and then he looks over and he sees me, both eyes open up, and he said, I love you very much, son. Put his head back, closed his eyes, and I had taught him how to say that. What? I, made, I, I, I taught him how to say that. I, I figured out, I knew what kind of a heart disease, disease he had. It was uh, restrictive heart disease, which means that the entire wall, muscle wall of the heart is hardening. No matter how many pacemakers you stick in there, you're not gonna get that thing to go. So I came to him on the phone after he had worked with me. He worked for me as an actor, one day job. And it impressed him. He never. He thought I was a loose cannon. When he saw that I actually had this whole set in control, could direct and act at the same time, would know whether the take was good, and didn't have to ask anybody else, he gained some respect. Well, I thought, you know, he's made that bridge. He's gone and wrote me this letter saying how good he thought I was and what an experience it was for him. So I called him up and I said, you know, the sports phrase, your clock is running and there are no timeouts. You start talking like that, son, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, well, you watch basketball games, so you know the phrase, the clock, the clock is running and there are no timeouts. But yeah, I said, well, your clock is running and you don't have any timeouts. And before you get out of this game, I'm going to teach you, if I have enough ego to say I'm an actor, a writer, director, producer, I'm going to write this scene and direct it for you. And the name of the scene is, I love you very much, son. He went, I, 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 and hung up. You're kidding. No, next time I'm talking to him from my ranch, I'm telling him how the apples are, how the kids are. In fact, it's mostly a one way, it's a monologue. And he was a painfully, painfully shy person. Hard to have a conversation. Why he loved acting, because he could do those things. Next time I talked to him, I didn't do the preamble about the acting and telling him how to do it. I just told him what was going on, and I said, I love you very much, Dad. <laughs> and he couldn't say it. No, I couldn't say it. The fifth call, which was not five days right together, but the fifth call, probably in the next week, he spurred out as fast as he could, I live to son. I said, no, Dad, you don't say it as a response to something I've said. It's originating in your heart. You have to find the moment in your heart. That's when it works. That's filling that moment. Now, I know you can do it. And so, more conversation, finally, he beat me to the punch. I love you very much, and I love you, Dad. Now, we have the phones between us. There's a long distance in plastic, a lot of protection. So I said, I'm going down. I have to be in town to do some business. I didn't have to, Roger. I was going down to look down the barrels and do this. I went to visit him. He was walking around with a walker in the house, shot back some tequila and had a beer behind him. I was going far out. Well, you know, he should do what he wants to do because, in fact, his clock is running and no time house. And he wanted to show me that he was you know, still a guy, I guess. And we walked to the front of the house. I said, I have to go. And we both knew this is the big one. He put his hands on my shoulders, and it was as if he were pushing me away and pulling me at the same time, his tears streaming down his cheeks. He said, I love you very much, son. I just grabbed him and hugged him so hard I could feel his pacemaker. And I said, I love you very much, Dad. And that's, that evolved into. When did you know in your life you needed him to say that to you? Probably when I was 12, 11 or 12. And when, how old were you when he finally said it to you? I was 39. What impact did that have on you, going all those years wanting it and never hearing it? Well, by the time I was 39, I realized it was not his plan. You know, he just didn't know how to. He was so, such a shy person, so embarrassed. God knows what happened with his family. How they, uh, we only had four stories that all of us ever heard about our paternal grandparents. We don't know anything about them. There's a little uh, hint of Marietta Baker in there, 
There's a little hint of Christian scientists. I mean, we're not sure. Your mother uh, committed suicide. Yes. Yes. Did that have an effect, or were you too young for no, it? No, I was not too young, and it has an effect. Um, but I was told she died of a heart attack, and that was when I was 10. Your father told you that? Mm-hmm. And uh, my father and my maternal grandmother kept all periodicals, newspapers, and magazines away from the house. Jane, who was at school with uh, people who were almost like our our sisters and brother, Brooke Hayward, who was uh, the daughter of Leland Hayward and Margaret Sullivan. Margaret Sullivan was my father's first wife, and they had three children, Brooke, Bridget, and Bill. Brooke was reading a, a, a magazine, and Jane saw this thing about the suicide, yes. and, and, but she didn't tell me. I don't know why, and uh, it's not interesting now why, but Nobody told me, and I was 13, and uh, I knew something was wrong. I came to my room in my school. I had an alcove, and I was a, uh, a student, so I was allowed to study in my room. There's a letter, and it looks like it's in my mother's handwriting. I rip open the envelope because I know something's wrong, and I read it. It's the same, dear Petey boy, and then go to the back, mummy with a smiling face, and I, for 24 minutes, I'm thinking, my mother's still alive. Mm. They've been lying to me. Well, they were lying to me, but it wasn't about her being alive. It was lying was, about killing herself. Yeah, so there, there was a major bad moment. Those 23 minutes took a long time to heal. When I was 15, I found out that she died by suicide. When I was 20, I found out she died by suicide in an insane asylum. And when I was 23, I found out she died by suicide in an insane asylum by cutting her throat from ear to ear. These are tremendous pops Whew. in your heart. You know, they're very hard pops. Are you over it? Yeah, I got over it in, in my 35th okay. birthday. 35th birthday. All right, we're here talking with Peter Fonda, who's uh, being very candid with us about some very tough times. Um, come on back. We've got more. talking with Peter Fonda. Uh, Peter, we just have a couple minutes left. You, you mentioned you learned this about your mother. Did you ever talk to your father about it? And, and did he ever finally level with you and say, here's the story, son? No, no, he never did. And when I would ask the elders in my family, it was as if when I talked, there was no sound coming out of my mouth. Nobody answered me. Uh, and in 1967, I found that my mother had written a letter to me and Jane and her first daughter, Pan, and they had burned up in a fire in Beverly Hills, or in Bel Air in 61, and I was 21. I could have used the information. It may not have helped me. It may have helped me. It wasn't right to have been withheld from me. And uh, Did you resent the family for withholding? I resented my grandmother, who, who should have, I never spoke to her again. I thought, you know, don't they realize this has been destroying me for so long, and I, I'm worth saving. Well, you just kind of saved yourself through it all, didn't you? Yeah, somebody had to. <laughs> <laughs> As I said earlier, my family motto is perseverate. It's the Latin imperative of the verb to persevere. It is not a suggestion. It is a command. I think that way back there in the 11th century, they knew I was coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you've, uh, you've overcome some, uh, some tough odds, and uh, uh, I, I respect that. I hope sometimes when people tell these stories, there are people who watch television and they say, you know, I got it tough right now, or I lost my mother, I lost my dad, or, or uh, you know, I really uh, don't have any kind of a break. And I think it's useful to tell these stories because people see that uh, no matter who your parents are or whatever, in the final analysis, somehow you got to get a hold of yourself and pull it together. Listen, I didn't get dumped into a dumpster. Mm -hmm. I That's wasn't thrown in a trash can. I mean, there's some people that were abandoned really from the get-go, and so I'm a lucky person. Peter, I appreciate you coming in and telling your story. Thank and, you. And uh, I would like to recommend to you folks that uh, you see Nadja. What are the two parts you play again? I play Dracula just in the beginning moment, and I play the man who stakes Dracula, Dr. Van Helsing. <laughs> oh, there's a shot. There's a shot. And uh, stand by for an upcoming autobiography that's bound to be a doozy. 
and he'll come back when he gets this book and, and talk. We, we'll, uh, we'll do another show with him. Thanks also to Congressman Sonny Bono. My best to you, Sonny. We'll see you all. Thanks for watching Straightforward. We'll see you next time. Good night, everybody.